Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the episode 21 of Engage Dialogue, live from the Engage Cast, DAV, and AVI Facebook page. I am Chara Chot. I am the Engage Project Manager of Sustainable Development Cluster, and it is the greatest honor to be the moderating today's dialogue. The thing next acts next the next gen CEU ASEAN Dialogue, think, think Tank Dialogue, that we call short Engage, is two year action proposed by the consortium of the CAST, DAV, and AVI, funded by European Union. And this engaged dialogue aims to promote awareness among the national and international stakeholders about engage while promoting the visibility of EU contribution to the ASEAN and EU partnership. And we aim to share insights and perspective of the engaged fellow. And today we're back and we're going to discuss about the insight on earth observations technology in support of sustainable development. And with me in this discussion, I have Dr. Dimitri. He is a senior scientist for the Sevier Megum program, and his background in physics, and he's hold a PhD in remote sensing from the University of the Leicester, awarded with the Mary's Curious Fellowship. He's well focusing on the translating Earth observation data into the tangible physical variable into the variety of the applications, such as the plant stability, vegetation, vegetation straight, forest fire risk, air quality, land use, land cover, wetland, small holder, and analysis of historic recent image. Thank you, Dr. Dimitri, for joining with us and here from Cambodia. Hello, Mr. Chord. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm glad to share my knowledge and thoughts with you uh, in this live webinar. That's great. Dr. Dimitri, how are you doing? I'm good. How about you? Thanks a lot. I'm doing good as well. Yeah. And thank you so much for uh, the this opportunity. And I think I believe that it's so interesting when you come up. Uh, we have you, and we have proposed the uh, um, the topic is about uh, observations. Before we move to the next question that we want to discuss more about the Earth observation and technology, I would like you to give us a little bit the definition. What is the Earth observations? Right, yeah, there are a lot of definitions of Earth observation, but I would like to uh, define the mainstream and simplified one. So Earth observation is a sector of the space industry. Space industry has lately gained a lot of attention with uh, several companies trying to uh, send tourists into space. Uh, but it started a long time ago, 60 years ago. And one section of the space industry is uh, sending satellites into orbit around the Earth for several applications uh, as for instance as the gps satellites which are associated with the gps signal we have our, our location based services on our mobile phones there are other satellites telecommunication satellites uh, perhaps one is used right now to stream this video all around the world and there are another uh, group of satellites approximately one third of currently the approximately 5000 satellites that are orbiting the earth which are looking the earth uh, with uh, sensors that are installed on board. So these are these sensors are for several applications, uh, but primarily are to look at land use and land cover of the earth. And that can be used for reconnaissance purposes from the army, but primarily for civilian applications. Uh, look what changes have been occurred on the earth uh, over time. And you can also retrieve biophysical parameters. So for instance, how healthy is the vegetation, uh, what type of land uh, we are looking at. And uh, this is approximately what Earth Observation is doing. Yeah, thank you for uh, the definition. I think like uh, audiences here, like they might understand more about what is Earth, Earth Observation. Um, maybe can you give a little bit more since you mentioned about a technology. So what kind of technology is used? So the technology has advanced a lot. So the first satellites were launched uh, 60 years ago. So from uh, the US intelligence agency, uh, that was reconnaissance satellites. So at this very primitive technology, uh, they were sending uh, onto high orbit airplanes. They were installing conventional cameras with films. And then these uh, cameras were taking images from space and then they were parachuting back to the earth. So most of these films are lost in the oceans. However, some of these films that were retrieved and then with 
uh, processing with the traditional processing that could uh, visualize these films. So in the last 60 years, of course, technology has evolved a lot. So now uh, we're installing uh, sensors which uh, measure uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, from the sensors on board satellites. And then they're live streaming, they're sending this data uh, to uh, ground stations. And in near real time of a couple of hours, they're available to the users. So we have to uh, uh, mention that uh, this is a type of image that we get yeah. at the end that has to be, to be translated into conventional information because an image is a, is, a, is a source of information. But of course, with the advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that we have nowadays, we can convert this sat satellite image into other tangible information. So, it's a, so Earth observation is a cross uh, section of several advanced uh, state-of-the-art technology, which involves electronics and uh, microsatellite systems, which uh, down to uh, satellite uh, image analysis and uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you, uh, Dr. For like sharing about the type and also the kind of the technology is used, but. Uh... Have you you already have mentioned about the number? I mean, for it, the the and so the different type of the technical they use. So can you give us a little bit more? Like, what is the difference between all the kinds and, um, especially like which one is the best thing to use, especially in as in country? Right. Yeah. So there are a variety of satellites, and the thing is that there is no one satellite that fits all purposes. Each satellite provides the different information for different applications. Uh, so we are uh, have approximately 5,000 satellites, active satellites right now orbiting the Earth, and there is an exponential increase in the number of satellites in the last few years, and we're going to see even more, even more satellites in the in the in the next years from now onwards. And uh, so these satellites um, uh, are employed are empowered by uh, sensors. Uh, which uh, sensors are specific to applications. So for instance, if we have an, a sensor which would like to look into vegetation, we would install uh, some sensors which retrieve information in the thermal infrared because vegetation is associated to the thermal infrared band. If we would like to observe uh, water quality or uh, inundation levels of the water, then we would install some sensors in the blue uh, channels. So it depends also on the application, which wavelengths we are using and which specific uh, sensors we would like to uh, use for this, uh, for this uh, reason. This is more interesting about this. Um, your background is like working for the data collection as well, right, uh, doctor? So like uh, my question to you, I regarding about the field data collections, I want you to mention about what is the, what are the advantages and disadvantages compared to the file data collections? Right, yeah. So uh, the main advantage of using uh, Earth observation is that you can have a large uh, area of coverage. So a single satellite can, uh, scan the whole Earth uh, in one day. We can have a representation of the whole Earth just every 24 hours for a specific uh, location. So that's the main advantage. This is impossible to do with field data collection. Even all of us, 8 billion people would do field work. We wouldn't achieve this uh, target, I believe. So this is the main advantage. The second advantage is that you have a homogeneous data source in the sense that uh, when people do field data collection, they have different perspectives and they might report things according to their knowledge or culture or how they perceive things. So a satellite and the sensor on board satellite is a uniform uh, is a uniform sensor. It's a it, it's an it is not biased uh, like we have the human bias when we criticize things, and you can provide objective information for uh, for any specific uh, data collection. So these are two main advantages. Uh, the third advantage and most important is that lately uh, satellite data are becoming increasingly available freely. So any person, you don't even need to be a scientist, even if you're a, a, a simple person, you can uh, log on the internet, uh, go to the website and download a high quality satellite image. So this is the main advantage that uh, with just a click from your own computer or laptop or even mobile phone, you can have access to this uh, data. 
So these are a few advantages, I believe, of Earth observation. And this is mainly why uh, governments or other authorities are trying to increasingly use data, uh, Earth observation data in their operational procedures because they understand that this is a useful tool for reporting and doing a collection. According to your own experience, do you think that this is a need to a lot of things of the collaboration or like between the, the researcher and also the government to do all the things, right? And how it challenge all the things? Definitely, absolutely. And let's not forget that uh, remote sensing and sci earth observation is a relatively young scientific field. Uh, it's less than 60 years old. And uh, let's uh, stress the fact that uh, the development of latest satellite uh, systems have been uh, done from the output from scientists. So it's the scientists primarily that are using the satellite images, and then they are they know exactly what they they would need to be done to improve the systems and what the users would need uh, in order to calibrate these systems. So it's a back and forth uh, communication between the the people who uh, develop these applications and the people who build the satellites. And the and the uh, and the uh, and the role of the scientist is very important. So, from my experience and having worked in several projects in the last uh, seven years after I got my PhD, and right now I work for an IGO, an intergovernmental organization, uh, I believe that this is a very important thing that the scientists and the uh, and the governmental or intergovernmental officials uh, work together. Uh, is quite difficult. I have to be. I have to say, it's quite challenging because the yeah. scientists see things from a different perspective. Um, an official would see things from another perspective. So there needs to be a golden line where the two people have to a little bit, let's say, compromise or try to understand each other. And then I think thing. I think at this stage things work when there is an effort from both groups to understand each other. Uh, then communication is established and we can move forward. Otherwise, it's very difficult for a scientist to see things from the perspective of, a, of an official and the vice versa. Communication is a key. Thank you for it, uh, Dr. Dimitri, for sharing all the experience. I think it's it will be a fact to the um, to the next generation or the the new researcher who want to do on the Earth's observation. They can understand well about uh, the two important things that they need to working on. And uh, seeing you have uh, a lot of things, especially regarding about uh, technology. I want to know, like, have related to technology progress in the last decade? Um, absolutely. In the last decade and in the last years, I mean, since I'm involved in the scientific development, I can say that things that happened two years ago sometimes are not valid anymore. Uh, right now, uh, uh, we are uh, working with satellite data that haven't even been launched. We work primarily with satellite data uh, with dummy files, so to prepare uh, to accommodate the satellite data when the satellite will be up in the sky. So as I said, one main section of uh, remote sensing and earth observation is machine learning. And things are running very, very fast in machine learning. And machine learning is important in our case because each satellite, uh, uh, the satellite is uh, acquired images continuously. It doesn't stop to acquire an image. The, the data that is acquiring is huge. So it's impossible that we have a user looking each single image every second to find something new. We need advanced uh, methodologies of uh, processing these images automatically. And this is where machine learning comes in. Uh, from the satellite image perspective uh, analytics, then I believe this is a, a domain that is running very fast and we see developments every uh, single year. From the satellite availability data, we also see uh, specific sections like let's say air quality. We see a lot of satellites launching and we're looking forward to work with this data as it augments the data vault that we can work with and it's really exciting to see uh, this data coming in. We are developing new applications and the focus is shifting into global products uh, where we can have a representation of the whole earth rather than study cases. And this is exciting because we can connect uh, these uh, studies with uh, climate change and sustainable development as well. Again, like for uh, the next questions, I want you to provide some example about application that you have mentioned earlier. So uh, you want to share the screen? 
Yeah, that would be great. Okay. I, I could share my screen. Uh, I could uh, showcase one specific example. Uh, some other examples, uh, for instance, where we use uh, uh, satellite data is for detecting fires or creating fire risk maps. Other applications is to you look into land use and land cover. Uh, look into drought, we can calculate uh, indices related to vegetation. There is really a myriad, there's really hundreds of applications to remote sensing. If you do a Google search, you'll be amazed how many things they have been uh, uh, found. So let me just share my screen. Um, I'll demonstrate very briefly an application which is related to air quality uh, that my colleagues and I uh, put effort on that in the last two years and it's used operationally by the Pollution Control Department, which is the authority in Thailand responsible for monitoring air quality. Uh, so this is the application where you will see uh, the dots here are representing air quality indicators, PM 2.5 concentrations at specific locations. So this is approximately 60 locations where the PCD has installed uh, sensors. So you would have just 60 locations with hourly data. This is what we get for the field stations. And these are very expensive instruments, I have to say. These are not cheap instruments. They're very, very expensive calibrated instruments. So when we make use of Earth observation, you can see that we can cover the whole, or the whole Southeast Asia here, the lower Mekong, with a single image. And the single image doesn't cost nothing. Uh, of course, it's freely available. This specific uh, image is provided by, by NASA. Uh, they have a, a sophisticated assimilation system which integrates a lot of the data, data sources to estimate PM2.5 PM concentrations. So in these applications, we put together this field data from uh, the ground stations and also the satellite image and it uh, updates uh, every, every three hours. This is an application and we can also forecast what will happen in, uh, with the PM2.5 concentrations. And this will show the forecast in the next 48 hours. So we can have an idea how their quality will be next day or two days from now onwards. Right, so this is the system we use in pollution uh, in Thailand and we're trying to expand uh, in the larger Aegean region right now in the next few years and we will hope uh, we hope we will be successful on that as air quality is a very pressing issue in the region, as you may know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, there's three. Would you mind to uh, share a little bit more? I have a question on this. I think it's so interesting to mention about this. I can see um, you kind of like uh, give the specific between like the, the healthy and unhealthy, and I can see a lot of things there. And I'm looking forward to see more like, um, you know, for uh, the expanding to the other country as well. But uh, your experience, according to this, because you said you always up there like three hours, did you ever see like the, the percentage of of the, the unhealthy in, increase to become like more better. Did you have a see uh, about like kind of this before? Uh, we see the opposite. Actually, the air pollution levels are increasing instead of decreasing. Uh, that's very worrying, as you may know. It's, especially in Southeast Asia, the uh, air pollution levels are constantly above the recommended uh, thresholds from the World, he World Health Organization. So in the World Health Org Organization has for several decades set uh, the threshold of 20, 25 uh, 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 for PM2.5 as the level where a beyond we, we is considered unhealthy. Now they have reduced that uh, to even lower levels. And to the new, uh, according to the new WHO level, by no means we live in a, in, a, in a clean area region in Southeast Asia, especially now during the dry season. As you may know, uh, there are a lot of agricultural fires and uh, they uh, exacerbate the problem in the region uh, by uh, emitting all these uh, pollutants during the burning of the agricultural residual crops. Thank you again for bringing it on. And so I have the question about the sustainable development. Um, I want to know more that uh, um, following the SOCAT you share about uh, for that and also the specifically on the sustainable development and climate change, how can it be used? Right, yeah. So air observation plays a major role in uh, supporting uh, the progress uh, towards the SDGs primarily. And uh, according to the United Nations, it is a very advantageous uh, tool, uh, specifically the images from satellites. And they're used primarily to produce uh, official statistics for each country, right? And these either uh, substitute or primarily complement the traditional sources. Uh, 
uh, for environmental and socioeconomic data. So uh, as, uh, I remember the United Nations uh, uh, has also uh, referred to satellite imagery as perhaps the only cost-effective technology to provide data at global scale. And that, that links very well with the, uh, with the studies of uh, climate change. This climate change is something that uh, refers to the whole globe rather than to specific areas, despite the fact that the aftermath of the climate change is, uh, is uh, uh, perceived differently in different parts of the area. Yeah. So, so um, okay, please, please continue. To come yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, um, so uh, so each country primarily uses uh, Earth observation to uh, uh, establish uh, good practice examples by using Earth observation data, and to monitor and calculate the SDGs. That's how they use Earth observation at the moment, and we see an, an ever increasing role of Earth observation in these efforts from uh, from the countries. It has been right now the main data source uh, on which they rely, especially large uh, uh, countries with very large territories, to report on their uh, on their uh, on what's going on in their own territories. Back to the slide that you shared me earlier, and also to the audience, I have the questions: um, Who is the user of the tool, and how can it help? to avoid air pollutions. Right, okay, so the tool I showcased, uh, the user is uh, primarily the pollution control department, but the pollution control department is just an authority. Uh, they have adopted this tool and they use it for their own purposes to monitor air quality. However, this tool is available to, the, to every person, every individual. They can go into the website and use the tool and get updates on what the air quality will be in the next uh, 48 or 72 hours. Uh, so the user can be actually anybody for these air quality uh, uh, web tools. Uh, now, if uh, in the second part of your question, if it can help to avert air pollution, well, a tool uh, cannot avert uh, air pollution, <laughs> to be honest. There, there should be more substantial efforts uh, that need to be taken to avert air pollution, such as reducing uh, the sources that create these air pollution problems. But however, the tool, what can do is to increase uh, public awareness and to educate people about the air pollution events. And the great way for people to take shelter, to uh, protect themselves from air pollution is to have the knowledge when there is air pollution. This is an information that this tool exactly provides. And when there are high levels of air pollution, they can protect themselves by staying indoors, uh, by avoiding doing excessive exercise outdoors, or just trying to uh, use some uh, machines to clean the air indoors and take some uh, precautions so that they can protect their health individually, right? So it can be used by any individual and it's very important to educate uh, the people, uh, all the public, and uh, be aware that air pollution is a dynamic phenomenon. So especially in the cities where we have uh, pollution is uh, uh, primarily induced by uh, vehicular exhausts and industrial activity is a phenomenon that doesn't have the same intensity during day and night. So we should be very careful at the specific time of the day or the specific season of the year uh, when there's air pollution to take control of our own health and try to protect uh, our health as much as we can. Yeah, Dimitri, like um, I want to know about the EU and ASEAN. Uh, does they already have the, this kind of technical use and also like what kind of can learn from each other regarding about Earth, Earth observations? Right, yeah. So uh, there is a lot of uh, things that we can learn from the Europe and the ASEAN. Uh, the, uh, the approach is a little bit different for Europe and Asia, I have to say, in sense that Europe has established a very uh, robust system called Copernicus, and they have uh, launched several satellites into the space. And they, uh, they record information and they provide this information freely over the internet for every user in every government or under an open, uh, open data access policy. And this, uh, this is something that has also been done by NASA and the USGS in America. Several of their satellites are freely available as uh, authorities have understood 
that when they keep their data uh, closed and they don't keep it, they, they have it, don't have it free, they cannot be used by a lot of people and authorities. So this open data policy is something very welcome. And we see a lot of studies and a lot of applications that use this open data, uh, for instance, our uh, tool, uh, the raster, the background layer I showed is from an, an open data access policy. So I think it's very important in uh, Asian and generally in the Asia Pacific, the authorities uh, at the moment, they take a more a nation, um, uh, let's say a focused approach. So each nation, especially the large nations which can support the financial uh, provision of this uh, expensive, uh, so to say, uh, uh, Earth observation related applications, they are keeping their systems uh, uh, closed for their own purposes. And I believe this is not very good, especially for the small countries, which don't have the budgetary, uh, uh, the budgetary uh, flexibility to support their own uh, uh, initiatives. So I believe uh, in uh, Aegean, we can learn from the uh, uh, practices of Europe where when two or more nations, they put their hands together, they can develop systems and have data that can be very important and used uh, by a lot of uh, users uh, worldwide. I think that's something we can learn from, the, from Europe. From the other hand, I believe that uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, is a region in the world which undergoes very rapid and important economic and infrastructural and consequently environmental changes. And in this sense, uh, Europe can learn from applications developed in Asia, as these changes are uh, easily to observe through Earth observation, something that might not be so easy in Europe, since things are a little bit stable there. There's not much going on at the uh, I have one last question to you, Dimitri, yeah. regarding about the uh, citizen. So I can see that you talk about the Earth observation technology toward the sustainable development. It's really important about this. Um, do you have any words to the audience, especially to citizen, to uh, in order to understand or in order to like uh, have knowledge regarding about the Earth observations? Yeah, I think uh, when uh, we speak about Earth observation, especially scientists, uh, we use a lot of jargon and very complicated things. These are very expensive and sophisticated systems from the scientific perspective. It absolutely makes sense to be very, very strict uh, with our words and very precise on what we are doing. From the other hand, uh, the public doesn't want this uh, jargon. They don't want complicated information. They just want to know what is the end product. And I believe lately there have been a lot of applications in this, uh, in this line. So I, as an advice to any user, when they see geospatial data, they should not be afraid because they should uh, always consider that they already use in a variety of geospatial applications. When we use our, our, our mobile phone, we always have the GPS signal. This is a geospatial product. We always use Google Maps or another, uh, another uh, company's uh, uh, map product for free. This is also a map compiled by Earth observation. It's not a map compiled by other data. So in the end, it's just a map that we have to become familiar and not care so much about the technical difficulties. We can leave this for the scientific and technical development. Thank you so much, Dimitri. And thank you again for uh, like sharing a lot of things insightful and very, very good discussion today. And thank you for joining with us and coming together for the great dialogue and the future is more sustainable on our Earth. And thank you to all the audience who are watching us from the live stream on our Facebook page. See you next week. Please stay safe and goodbye. Thank you so much. Goodbye.